The soil microbiome and quorum sensing. Uh, those of you who did manage to hear my talk this morning, I was saying that the presence of green plants is the most important factor for soil health, but it's not enough just to simply have green plants. We've realised that there's a lot more going on in this world that we live in, and last year there was a, uh, a census of life on Earth where all the different life forms were measured in gigatons of carbon. A gigaton is a billion tonnes, so that was, that was a lot. And the scientists who undertook that survey figured out there was 550 gigatons of carbon-based life forms, and of those, 450 gigatons was in plants, which is not surprising. Well, there's a squirrel running past. Most, um, most parts of the world that you go to, when you look out, you see plants, you know, ground cover plants, trees, shrubs, whatever. So it's not surprising that most of the life on Earth in terms of the weight is actually in plants. What is surprising, though, is if we look to see what is in the other 100 gigatons. So all of the other things other than plants that are living on this planet make up 100 gigatons. And the things that we can't see, the things that we need a microscope to see, the protists, the archaea, the fungi, the bacteria, actually comprise 93% of that weight. So if we look at that diagrammatically, we see um, there you've got your, your protists, the orange, and your archaea, the purple, fungi, the, blue, the green, and then bacteria, look at that, 70 gigatons of bacteria um, out, of, out of that 100 gigatons. And this is, this is by weight. Um, things that we can see, like insects, mollusks, are things like snails and slugs, uh, or in the ocean, the mollusks would be uh, things like oysters and clams. And then we have all the fish in the ocean. I mean, just think how much of the planet is actually taken up with ocean and how many things live in there. And then the things that live in our soils that we can see, like nematodes and earthworms, and, and then our livestock, our sheep, our cattle, our domestic pets, and then people, humans, all of those things that we can see with, our, with the naked eye that we don't need a microscope for make up 7% of that 100 gigatons. And in the final analysis, humans comprise only 0.01% of the biomass of life on Earth. And this, that's by weight. We're talking weight, not number. So if we look at one teaspoon of healthy soil, it contains more microbes than there are humans on the Earth. So it, by, in weight, they are outnumbering us, and in number, they are like one teaspoon of them is outnumbering all of us. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you look at that figure there and realise how many microscopic organisms there are out there that we can't see with the naked eye, all of the plants and the animals are embedded in a microbial world. We are totally embedded and we have a microbial world embedded within us. As we are realising more and more these days when we talk about the human gut microbiome, when we look at the research that's undertaken into the, rumens, the rumen of livestock and, um, and now more recently looking at what's happening in the soil. So it's actually a good thing we're realising that we are embedded in a microbial world and we have a microbial world embedded within us because microbes are capable of performing many amazing tasks that we, uh, with all of our intelligence and our size, are not able to perform. And we're now realising more and more when we talk about symbiosis and endosymbiosis that the natural world is composed of interdependent communities of organisms. And there's no such thing as an independent organism. For a long time we have thought of ourselves as being fairly independent. We have thought that we can do whatever we like really on this planet without taking notice of other living things. But all species need other species to survive and that includes us. That we even, well we need the plants for a start to photosynthesise and create the food that we eat, we need plants to photosynthesise and create the oxygen that we breathe, but then we need the microbes that are in our guts and the microbes that are in the soil and in our animals to actually make everything function on a different scale than the broader scale that, than we've considered in the past. I'm quite sure why this doesn't. So if we look at the... Um, what's going on here? If we look at, the, at human health, for example, and I mentioned this very briefly this morning, we see that many uh, health issues are linked to a failure to support a diversity of microbes in the human gut. And an interesting example of that right here in the United States was the American Gut Project, 
which is a citizen science project that involved about 11,000 people conducting a survey where they had to fill out a questionnaire about uh, what you eat, um, your lifestyle, how healthy you are, what kind of health issues you have, and then collect a faecal sample, send that in the mail to the laboratory where it was analysed to see what kind of microbes you had in your gut. So they were, they were able to link what you eat and how well you are, your wellness and your quality of life to the microbes that were in your gut. And what they found in the American Gut Project was that people who consumed 30 or more different plant foods in a week actually had a far more diverse gut microbiome and were healthier um, and had less health issues than people who consumed 10 or less. Now I can see a few people smiling about that because I imagine there will be some people that can't name 30 vegetables and may maybe some that can't name 10, probably not in this room but maybe in one of the other rooms if I'm allowed to say that. Can they hear me in the other rooms? <laughs> um, and in fact the standard American diet, the SAD diet, is basically revolves around five things. That's just like just about every meal that you have every day, if you're on the standard American diet, has the same five things. that You'll have them for breakfast and you'll have them for lunch and you'll have them again for dinner and then you'll have them again the next day. So it's a very, very simplified diet. And I mentioned this morning that there's now 80, over 80 autoimmune disorders, which is just your body not functioning as it should, and that one in six Americans have an autoimmune disorder. It's got a lot to do with what you're eating and the fact that there's maybe not even enough diversity in what you're eating as well as the quality of the food. So we, we look again now at the animals and um, Professor Fred uh, Provenza, who has uh, done some very famous work in the United States at Utah State University, looking at behavioural things and diet selection in livestock. He found that the diets rich in secondary plant compounds, which are the things that you find in the in the, the forbs and things in like a diverse ecosystem like on a rangeland, that if animals have contact or, or consume uh, a wide range of plant foods, that this increases microbial diversity in the gut and that, in, that actually enhances their ability to digest a wide variety of things. So the more different things they eat, the better they can digest those things and that improves their feed conversion efficiency, which is very important if you have livestock because the same amount of feed is going to produce uh, either more weight on an animal or more wool or more milk depending on what kind of an animal it is. And it improves their immune function as well and they're much healthier. Same thing applies to horses. If they get a wide diversity of foods, they're actually much, much healthier. So does this diversity principle that we know applies to the human gut, that we know applies to animals, does it apply to soils? Well, yes. We find that susceptibility to pests and diseases, um, the low nutrient status that I talked about this morning that we're seeing in, in many of our uh, grains and our fruits and vegetables, poor plant productivity, um, that things, crops are having to be propped up all the time with fertiliser because they're not able to feed themselves, which they should be perfectly capable of feeding themselves. They're all linked to low diversity in the soil microbiome. And if a simplified system, such as we see in agriculture around the world now, is a degraded system. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the human gut, the animal gut, or the soil, if it's simplified, if it doesn't have diversity, it's not going to function effectively. And many of our agricultural landscapes have become so simplified that we have actually even not aware of the extraordinary productivity that they're capable of if they had been more diverse. Now, if you think about the, the original prairies that were here, sorry, this seems to be jumping over. Oh well, doesn't want to go back. All right, well the, the slide before that said that there was something like, um, oh, I seem to be having some technology problems. Do I have to point this somewhere? Down the back, ah, oh, right. I thought I had to point it somewhere down here. Right, so 500, 700 plant species. I was in Oklahoma a couple of months ago and they'd just uh, done some monitoring on a, on a ranch there and they found 760 different kinds of ground cover plants. And that's even now, today, after I'm sure that there would have been things lost from there. We know our Australian grasslands were also incredibly diverse, hundreds and hundreds of different species, usually more non-grasses than grasses, about 40% grasses. Um, so we tend to think of, of prairies as we think of the grass because that was the dominant thing. But there's all kinds of little plants that ran around in between the grasses and low low level kinds of plants and lots and lots of flowers. If you look at the original drawings and paintings that were done of the early days of settlement of the prairies when there was wagons 
horses and wagons and things, you notice that in springtime the prairies were just absolutely full of flowers. So we have to think about those flowering plants and the role that they also play in the ecosystem and I think that's one of the things with our cover crops um, and the sorts of photos that David was showing, you know, having things like sunflowers um, and other flowers in there is very, very important for many reasons. Um, so we, what we used to think about the prairie was that the reason it was so productive was that uh, the, root, the plants all have different kinds of roots. It's a, this variation in root architecture was thought to underpin the fact that a diverse plant community was always more productive in terms of biomass than if you just took one of those plants and had a monoculture of just one thing that was in there, it could never produce as much biomass as this, this mixed community can. And if you look at some of those roots, you'll see some have like very deep tap roots and others have shallower fibrous roots. And so they're not really competing as much as they would if they all had the same kinds of roots. So what they call niche complementarity was considered to be the reason that it was more of a cooperative community rather than a competitive one. Then we discovered about mycorrhizal fungi and other beneficial organisms that live in the soil and realised that all of these plants are joined together underground by common mycorrhizal networks where mycorrhizal hyphae actually link all of the plants. They can exchange nutrients and it can exchange water and they can support each other. And when you think about uh, why would mycorrhizae bother investing all that energy into supporting a plant community, it's because the underground network um, will survive better if there's a big diversity or a wide diversity of plants above ground. Because what happens when you have a diversity of plants above ground is if you, at different times of the year when some don't grow, there will still be other ones that are growing. Or if it's very dry, there'll be some that will grow. If it's very wet, there'll be some that will grow. So the more diversity you have in that community, the more the chances are that there will be something actively growing and photosynthesising over a wide part of the year. And that means there's going to be energy being channelled down into the soil ecosystem to feed mycorrhizal fungi. So the things in the soil that depend on plants for their survival are going to survive better if there's a diversity of plants above ground. So it's to their benefit to keep all of those plants alive if you want to put it in that kind of a perspective. Um, if, my, if mycorrhiza can think. But uh, we might, it's, it's interesting to see just what microbes are actually capable of doing. So we know that diverse plant communities support a diverse soil microbiome, and that was the photo I had up at the beginning of the presentation. These are just some of the fungal spores that are in soil under a diverse plant community, and they're actually quite a big range of colours and, and sizes and shapes there. <laughs> All right, so does the soil microbiome respond differently once a certain threshold of plant diversity has been achieved. We know that diversity, if you have a whole lot of different kinds of plants, every single plant, including varieties within species, supports a different, what we call a microrhizosphere. In other words, there's, there's different microbes around the roots of every kind of plant even different varieties of the one thing. There are going to be different microbes around the roots. So what happens if you have a, enough diversity to actually completely change that soil microbiome? Like, is there a tipping point? Is there, what's a good amount to have? If two kinds of plants is better than one, is four better than two, is eight better than four, 16 better than eight, etc. You know, like, where, is there some level that we can say, oh, well, if we've got 10 different kinds of plants in this cover crop, that's definitely going to be better than having three or four or something. Is there some kind of a tipping point? So I am now going to try and change to the next slide. We'll see what happens. Right, we've got, whoa, we've got all the screens showing the same thing. Uh, one, one example of that, we saw the Burley County Soil Conservation District uh, did a cover crop trial after Jay Fuhrer from NRCS uh, he might not have been with NRCS at that time, but anyway, he was with Burley County Soil Conservation District. He went down to No-Till on the Plains in 2006 with some other farmers from North Dakota, including Gabe, Gabe Brown, and they heard Adamir Caligari speak about covers and say, well, you're never really going to make much progress until you have diversity in your covers. Cover crops are good, better than bare ground, definitely, but you need diverse covers. So they went back and they did an experiment uh, where they had individual one-acre plots of the things that they had been using as cover crops like radish and turnip, soybean, cowpea, lupins, red clover, ryegrass, etc. And then they had some two-way mixes, three-way mix, four-way, five, and then they had a six-way mix as well. And there was a lot of effort went into putting in these trials, 
but they thought that the whole thing had failed because they only received one inch of rain between seeding in late May and then harvest in late July. And what happened to all the individual plots where it was just one acre of one thing or even the two-way, three-way, four-way mixes? I'm just going to show you one example here. This is the oilseed radish. At the end of July in 2006, this is how much it had grown. The other monocultures were all exactly the same. So all of these plots were harvested and weighed and they did protein and energy analyses and um, it was all like it was a properly conducted trial. But on that same day, 31st of July 2006, where there was a multi-species cover that had cowpeas, soybean, turnip, turnip, sorry, there's a comma there, oilseed radish, millet and sunflower, on that same day, this is what it looked like. So what was going on there? How come when you put all those things together, the plants are not showing any evidence of moisture stress, even though they only received one inch of rain, and all the other things where it was just something growing on its own, you would think, well, something growing on its own should have theoretically had more chance of being able to deal with that low moisture environment. So what was it about the diversity that enabled those plants to survive? That was in 2006. I, have, I, wasn't, I didn't actually see that, but I've seen people show photos of that um, multiple times. You've probably seen them yourself. But around the world since then, I have seen many, many examples of the same kind of drought tolerance when you put a whole lot of plants together. One of the examples was in Alberta back in 2015 at the Chinook Applied Research Association uh, trials in Oyen, Alberta. So applied research associations have produced input into what kinds of uh, experiments are conducted on their field station. And they had a triticale monoculture um, that had been sown down across a large field and in one corner there was a cocktail crop where the local producers had, I think Gabe Brown might have been there the year before, and were just curious to see what would happen if they put a whole lot of plants together. So that uh, cocktail crop had the same triticale, plus oats, tillage, radish, sunflower, field peas, faba beans, chickpeas, prozo millet, and foxtail millet. Now if we have a look and see, and it was a very, very dry year, very hot, dry summer, 2015 in Alberta. That's what the triticale looked like. So it obviously wasn't going to go through to yield. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was just hanging on in there. Now there's plenty of space around those plants. You think there's not really going to be, they're not, sorry, really competing with each other. Um, and then over in one corner of the field, probably an area about twice the size of this room, was this little handkerchief area with the cocktail crop in it. And the, okay, <laughs> well, we have, that's what it looked like. Look at the triticale there and look at all of the other plants. So how can that be that when it's growing on its own, it looks like that? And then when you put a whole lot of other plants in with it, it looks like that. Same soil, same rainfall, no one's watering that. I mean, how can it, what, what's going on there? So that's one thing, is the moisture. When you would think that having all those different plants would actually use more moisture. When I was talking about this in South Dakota at the Grass-Fed Exchange um, in Rapid City in June last year, Brett Nix, who was one of the other speakers there, said he had been um, playing around with cover crops for several years and he'd usually been using a five-way mix and he kept trying different five-way mixes and then after a couple of years he ended up with a whole lot of different seeds in his shop and he thought, well, I'm just going to uh, collect all these seeds, put them all together and, and plant them because they're just going to sort of deteriorate if I leave them lying around, they'll, you know, lose uh, viability from sitting in the shop. So he put out, that year he put out one of his five-way mixes and then he had a 27-species mix it turned out to be an incredibly dry year and the 27 species mix never looked back. The five-way mix failed. So he said, I have seen on my own farm exactly what you're talking about. An experiment from uh, Germany, Jena, quite famous Jena biodiversity experiment. has been running for 15 years in eastern Germany. There have been several hundred papers on soil microbiology, soil carbon, um, insects um, and, and plant productivity like that have come out of this, this trial. They looked at a whole lot of different kinds of mixes of plants, collected as much data as they could, not only about the biomass, but as I said, about the insects and also about the microbes in the soil. But what they found in that experiment was if, where they did a multifactorial um, trial with 
one, two, four, eight or 16 different kinds of plants in a relatively small area, they're about 10 metre, these plots, and grew them with either 0, 100 or 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, and it's a multifactorial experiment. So you have maybe one species with none, 100 or 200 pounds of nitrogen, right through to 16 different kinds of plants growing together with none, 100 or 200 pounds of nitrogen. And what they found was that if they had eight or 16 plants growing together in a plot, that they produced greater biomass than having just one or two plants there with 200 pounds of nitrogen. So what I'm saying is that 200 pounds of nitrogen on a monoculture or 200 pounds of nitrogen on a low diversity polyculture cannot produce what a diverse sward can produce with no nitrogen. Diversity can replace fertiliser easily and more productively. And what they found in the Yana experiment was that if you looked over time, or looked over, sorry, looked over the number of species, so what you have on the uh, on the x-axis is plant biomass, in other words, more and more weight as you go up, and then along the, this axis here, the number of species, 2, 4, 8, and 16. So as you have more plants in a mix, the biomass that's produced increases, as it would have been the case in the prairies um, with more biomass. They also found that soil carbon increased with plant species richness. So the more different kinds of plants, the more carbon there was in the soil. And they put that down to exudates from plant roots. So this is out of a little video, just a screenshot out of one of their videos. It's available on the net. And if you Google Yena, J-E-N-A, Yena Biodiversity Experiment YouTube, YouTube video, I think it's about eight minutes. It's a great little video. It explains. This is another screenshot from that video. So on the left-hand side, you have a low diversity, there's just two, two different kinds of plants in there, shows you that the soil is quite shallow, and then this uh, one on the right is a more diverse mix, and it is building deeper soil. They also found that there was much more nitrogen in that soil, much more phosphorus in that soil, uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, all the things that they measured. So having more diversity above ground produced more nutrient availability in the soil, as well as deeper soil and more carbon and much better water holding capacity. Um, and their high diversity plots produced 21.8% 21, 21 on average more carbon compared to having one, two or four different kinds of plants. And then just one other example uh, from, I'm just looking at the time, I'm going to have to go fairly quickly here, from New Zealand. This was last year. Uh, these are dairy farmers in New Zealand. They have an ash soil or a pumice soil. It's from a very a explosive uh, volcanic type of a soil. It's very high in silicon and it, or silica and it feels very gritty when you feel it in your fingers. It's very, very low fertility soil. And according to expert opinion, if you want to grow anything in um, ash soil, you need to add just about every nutrient that plants need to grow, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and all the trace elements and everything. So for years, they've been running a dairy farm by putting a whole heap of nutrients. Their fertilizer bill is huge on these ash soils. And then three years ago, Maya came to a workshop of mine where I was talking about the need for them to get off nitrogen fertiliser and how they could um, use a biostimulant instead and still get the same yields. So he uh, did do that and came to... That's another photo of their soil. Um, showed me how much soil they'd built. That's his son Taylor there actually holding that, that soil upside down. But you can see in the background that their ryegrass and clover pasture is basically what they, what they have. And nearly every dairy farm in New Zealand is based on ryegrass and clover, so it's a very, very low diversity. If you went back to the 1920s and 30s, there would have been uh, probably 15 or 20 different kinds of pasture species all grown together, but for some reason they've narrowed that down, used lots of nitrogen fertiliser. But if I just turn that photo upside down, um, you can see that they've built about six inches of topsoil using um, a biostimulant and interestingly their milk production didn't go down so they're building soil and, improve, and maintaining their production and they were slashed the fertiliser bill by half so they were very impressed with that and then I said well Maya you could actually make a lot more progress if you had a diverse plant community there. You did need to get off the nitrogen but now you need to think about diversity. So he went back and tried it just on one small area so if you look at those cars down at the bottom there, they're at the corner of a paddock that's only five acres. 
The sheepdog up the front is sort of at the top of the hill and there's a water trough over there on the right that is also in this same five acre paddock. And this has been sown down to a 12 way mix. And we went in there to have a look and see whether the strawberry clover, or sorry, the red clover that was in there, whether it had actually nodulated. We weren't expecting to see anything other than we're just gonna look at the roots of the strawberry clover. So there's Meyer digging a hole in his field. You can see there's a lot of chicory in that, in that area there. That was one of the things in the mix. And this is what the soil that came out. So that's a pretty big contrast to what he used to have before. And he was so surprised at seeing that that he actually didn't react to it at all because he couldn't believe it. And he thought, he said, we must have burned a tree here and just basically put that soil back and moved away to dig another hole a couple of metres away. And when he dug another hole, it came out the same. And he was kind of a bit confused, so he moved a few metres away from that and dug another one, it was the same. And then he got very excited and started rushing around digging holes everywhere and the whole hillside basically was the same. And uh, he was pretty stunned about that and I think they went to the pub that night, he and his wife, and celebrated the fact that well, he had actually built all this topsoil. And I must admit that I was pretty surprised too because that multi-species forage crop had only been there for five months. He had been off nitrogen fertiliser for three years prior, but this crop had only been in the ground for, for, these are all perennial plants, but they'd only been there for five months. So the next morning I phoned him and said, I need to come out and have another look and I want to compare all the paddocks around that one just in case that whole hillside for some reason has suddenly, I mean, how could it transform to a different kind of soil? You know, uh, so he said, I've already been out this morning, I've already dug another hundred holes and I can promise you that it's um, just the same. But we have, or the company that supplied the biostimulant actually has been back and, um, and done a whole lot of measurements. So when you look now at that, that, that this photo is looking from that field out across the rest of his farm, which is all ryegrass and clover. As I speak now, that's all been transformed to multi-species as well. And the reason is because uh, the company that supported that did these, uh, looked at these, looked at the soils, the cation exchange capacity had increased 50%. That's huge. All of the nutrients, including nitrogen and phosphorus, which they don't, they're no longer adding, had all increased. Um, the total organic carbon level had tripled in the top eight inches that they looked at. And if they looked deeper, they would have found even more than that. BRICS levels, which is an indicator of the, the energy level and the mineral level, the sugars and the minerals, the trace elements in the plants had tripled. And it's not surprising that milk, milk production increased 300 litres every time the cows came into that field. Um, and the somatic cell count had halved. That's, a, that's an indicator of whether there's any infection in the udder. So if cows have mastitis, they will have a high somatic cell count. And when the milk goes to the factory to be processed, if it's got a lot of somatic cells in it, um, it will either be discarded or there'll be a, the price will be reduced. So it's important for farmers to keep their cows healthy and with a low level of mastitis. And when they're on really good feed, their mastitis levels went down, their fertility improved. They've got 80% higher fertility in their cows and Maya, in a recent email, said he would now be able to carry twice the number of cows on that farm with the same amount of land um, because they have a diverse pasture and they're not using fertilisers anymore. So it's a really good news story and building lots of soil. So if we look across New Zealand, we find other people that have um, improved the diversity of their pasture have seen the same things with improved animal nutrition. These are all, um, these ones I'm talking about now are, are research trials that have been undertaken by universities. And the data is all there in the literature if anyone is interested. Um, you probably don't have that many dairies here in Ohio, or not, on, not, not out on grass anyway. But animal nutrition, growth rates, milk production, conception rates have all improved, reduced dependence on vets, and, and of course builds soil. So how can plant diversity have such a dramatic impact? Is it due to quorum sensing? That's the question that I'm posing. So in the human society, a quorum is the number of members of an organisation that must be present in order for any kind of business to be transacted or for a decision to be made. So if you had something, uh, well, I don't know what you would have here, um, say there was the board of Ohio State University, if, if there is a board, uh, and they had to make a decision about, say, spending $10,000 on upgrading some facility at the university, and there were, let's say there was 10 members of the board and seven of them had to be there in order for that decision to spend that money to be made. And there was a meeting held about it and only five people turned up. So if you didn't have a quorum, if you didn't have the seven people, the minimum that was supposed to be there, 
then they would not be able to make that decision to spend that $10,000. You have to have a minimum number of people for that decision to be made. If you belong to a group or it's a, you're a committee or on a board, I'm sure you all understand how a quorum works. Well, in a, in a microbial world, the quorum... What did I do wrong then? Right, we've got all three the same. So in the microbial world, the term quorum sensing refers, to, again, to density-dependent behaviour. You could have a certain number of microbes of a certain species that's able to do something like lactobacillus, it's able to make vitamin B12 or something like that, and if you don't have enough of them there, they will simply not perform that task. So we have to have these, these critical... There are critical thresholds in microbial numbers for them to be able to behave in a coordinated fashion and complete some kind of a task like bring nutrients to a plant, for example, or protect a plant from pathogens or assist a plant to uh, obtain moisture in a, in a dry, hot, dry year. All these kinds of things that microbes, these tasks that microbes can perform for plants, they won't perform unless they reach a quorum. And then when they do reach a quorum, they can alter gene expression within their hosts. We know that bacteria in, in the human gut can actually switch our genes on and off. It's pretty amazing to think that uh, these little things that we can't see actually are affecting our genome. A lot of the autoimmune disorders that we have are because the genes that we need for immunity have been switched off because we're on such a simplified diet that we don't have enough diversity in our gut microbiome to actually activate those genes. So again, we think we're so clever and we're so highly evolved that, you know, we are um, masters of our own fate, if you like, but it's actually the microbes in our gut that are controlling our, particularly our health and even our human consciousness. This happens in the soil too, and this ha was what's happening with plants uh, in, our, in our crops and our, in our pastures. I know that's going to jump too now. <laughs> So it's density-dependent coordinated behaviour. It occurs in all bacteria, archaea, fungi and viruses. All of these microbes use quorum sensing to collectively coordinate their behaviour and uh, to achieve certain outcomes. So they can't see, they can't speak, they can't hear, but they do communicate with each other extremely well and they're incredibly well organised. If you think about what happens when you contract something like a cold or the flu, when you first take those bacteria or viruses, when they first come into your body, you could overcome them very, very easily. You're much bigger than a virus. You're much bigger than a bacteria. You could eliminate them if you knew that they were there, but they're under the radar. They sit in your body multiplying very, very rapidly. And when they reach a quorum, when they can detect that there are enough of them there to overpower you, then they switch their genes on, their virulence genes. And if you want to read about that, there are now thousands of scientific papers out there about how this works, about how pathogens that invade our bodies become virulent or pathog pathogenetic, if that's the right word, I'll just say virulent, uh, only when they reach a critical density in your body. So they're very, very well organised. And how do they do that? Well, how they do that is that they use a chemical signal called an auto-inducer. Every species has its own signal. So if you have bacteria, for example, in an environment like your gut, and they're producing signals that says, I'm here, and there are other ones the same that are producing signals saying, I'm here, then we go, oh, okay, so there's enough of us here to do something. We can do this collectively. If there's not enough of us or... They can also pick up on signals from other kinds of bacteria and fungi and viruses. If there's a whole lot of other guys out there, uh, or if there's a big human being there that's bigger than, than we are at the moment, we're just going to keep really quiet and stay under the radar. So it's, this is how microbes actually detect, um, because they can't hear, see, think or whatever, this is how they detect what's going on in their environment and how they coordinate their behaviour. When the concentration of auto-inducers in the environment actually reaches a critical level, then as I said, it can regulate gene expression in their host or in the microbial um, environment. And they're multilingual. Um, as I said, they, can, they know how many of me there are and how many of others there are. 
So it's a bit like the communication in our body, in a way. I'm probably not explaining it very well, but we have heart, liver, lungs, spleen, kidneys, adrenals, you know, hypothalamus, whatever, that all of those organs in your body are sending signals, receiving signals, all of the time to coordinate you as a single unit so that you can effectively digest food, use that energy for all the things that you need to do, uh, keep your heart beating, keep breathing, uh, hopefully thinking, and for your, um, your adrenals and your hypothalamus and pituitary, uh, all of those things to be producing hormones all of the time that are regulating all of the functions that are going on in your body without you even thinking about it. So we really don't know what the levels of those things are. We can only see what the outcome is. Are we behaving as a coordinated human being? Are we able to do the things that we'd like to be able to do because of all those chemical signals that are happening in our body? And we know very well what happens if that signalling system gets disrupted. So what happens in agricultural soils is that the signalling systems are being disrupted all of the time by the things that we do. When we put in something like a diverse uh, cover crop, for example, and start having lots and lots of different communities of microbes all working together and working in conjunction and starting to coordinate their behaviour, that's when we see massive changes in the outcomes. Because it needs to behave, the soil biome needs to behave as a coordinated superorganism, if you like. It needs to behave as a, as a living thing, just like a human body. Now, plant or animal genome is the complete set of genetic material in that organism. We know when the human genome was mapped that we are only using about 8% of our genes. So what are the other not, what's the other 92% of DNA doing sitting there? So how come there's so much inactive? Well, some of that inactive DNA can actually be activated by your gut microbiome, and it could well be that we're not using anywhere near as much of our DNA as we, as we would if we had a more diverse um, gut flora. So our genes, like human genes, we know for sure can be influenced by the embedded and surrounding microbial population. And we know then now if we look at the agricultural situation, we know above ground um, that plants provide habitat and food for other life. I mean, it's very obvious when we just look that you can see that there's a whole lot of layers of things that will live above soil provided you have green plants there. But we also have to think... Um, we know that if we eliminate them, then we eliminate most other life above ground. And it's the same if we look at, if we've eliminated plants above ground, we eliminate nearly all of the life below ground. Nearly all of it. Um, and so things just can't really work below ground if there's no plants above ground to support the life, the underground web of life. So yesterday, or sorry, this morning, I said that living plants actually support these microbes that create, um, you know, the high nutrient status, well-structured, friable topsoil with high water holding capacity, everything that we, we want. And we talked, I talked about the riser sheaths. Now, these riser sheaths are an example of quorum sensing. For the, for the microbes in the soil to coordinate their activities and build that structure when they can't think or talk to each other or speak or... I mean, how, isn't that extraordinary that they're able to coordinate, get themselves organised to be able to build a riser sheet around a plant root? Um, there's another example here of a farm in Western Australia. Look at the riser sheets on that wheat plant there. That seed has produced a coleoptile. It hasn't even produced any leaves yet. It's not photosynthesising. It's produced three seminal roots. And look at the riser sheets around those roots. It's... Um, that's an example of biofilm. That's biofilm formation with bacteria and fungi coordinating their behaviour and working together to, to build that incredible environment. That is quorum sensing what you're seeing right there. And inside, as I showed this morning, I'm not sure, yes, I showed you that one, um, you can see the life that's inside that biofilm and all of the nutrients that the plant needs and everything else, the protection from uh, pathogens, it, it's all going to happen within that riser sheath. Building soil. Um, and I didn't get to talk about this this morning, but plants can't build topsoil if we're using a lot of high analysis fertilisers around the roots. And this is what I didn't get to show you this morning, but I'm just showing you now. This plant here, 
These are the seeds. This is wheat again. There was 80 units of N put beneath the seed. There are absolutely no riser sheaths on those roots below that, those wheat seeds. And up here, where there was compost put on the soil surface, you can see that the, the roots have built riser sheaths. So it's pretty clear that even on one plant, the plant can detect where not to build a riser sheath and where to build one. And that's, uh, again, that's riser sheaths, high magnification, um, and the neighbour's property where they've used N. So this, this is what roots look like if you look at them under the microscope, where you use a lot of nitrogen fertiliser, there is no corum around those roots. So that plant is not able to grow in stressful conditions like, you know, hot, dry or nutrient deficiency or it is not able to cope with any pests or diseases. It doesn't have the microbes around its root that it requires to assist it with all of the things that plants need to do. So if we learn how to harness this power of microbes, which we now know from the research that was done last year, that there are extraordinary numbers of microbes out there, even by weight, that they can assist us in crop production, um, not only to produce food of high nutritional quality, which is going to be the key to human health, but also dramatically improving the soil carbon, um, which is the key to increased productivity and, uh, and profitability. Because this morning I showed that diagram of the Canadian net farm income, where that blue area, which is the difference between gross revenue and net revenue, was getting wider and wider every year, and we need to go back the other way so that net revenue is pretty much the same as gross revenue. And once a quorum of people recognise these interconnections, um, we can begin to restore human health and climatic stability. So we really need to get the understanding out there because we behave collectively and cooperative as well. Well, we should, <laughs> uh, just like microbes do. It's like if there is one person in a room that believes something and the other 99% of people don't believe it, it's almost impossible to get any kind of change. And there's some tipping point in there. We're not quite sure what it is, maybe 10% or something. Of 10% of people in the room actually believed, yeah, diversity is important, cover crops are important. Yes, you can build soil, you can reduce nutrient leaching, you know, you can improve profitability, that then that could be sufficient for the rest of the population to actually start experimenting with those things and trying them for themselves. But while ever there's only a few people, it's very difficult. I think we are reaching a tipping point in uh, regenerative agriculture, if I could use that word. There's a greater understanding of the fact that biology is incredibly important for our survival and our health and our family's health. I mean, I think it's really when you start looking at the kids these days and seeing all of the illnesses and the issues and the pain and the trauma that children are going through because of the way we're growing food, and because of the way we're treating soil, and that we could turn all of that round if we can understand how to use microbes. I'm not talking about putting microbes on the soil. I'm talking about growing a diversity of plants to support the microbes that are in the soil. We can overcome most of these problems almost overnight really, once a quorum of people understand that this is important to our future. Thank you. <laughs>